So in the past, we've talked a little bit about spore swabs. I told you guys why we use them, how to take them properly, what the necessity of having spore swabs is. And the truth of the matter is, if you guys are trying to build your library and you're on a budget, spore swabs are gonna be your biggest bang for your buck. On average, a spore swab is five to $10 versus a syringe or a print which could run all the way up to $50. You know, you could get a lot of spores for a lot cheaper if you guys decide to go with the spore swabs. Now, some people will say, well, if a vendor sells spore swabs, it's just a money grab. But to be honest with you guys, it's a good idea because a lot of people are on budgets and they want to try to get the most for as little as possible. So it's good to have that option in there for the people that want to pay a little bit less and get a little bit more. Now the issue with spore swabs is they're not as easy as spore syringes or prints. You know, you can't just flame sterilize, inoculate your grains, let them colonize, and then fruit them out. You actually have to do a little bit of work before you could actually put the spores to use. And a lot of people don't know how to properly use a spore swab. So in this video, I'm gonna show you guys the correct way to use a spore swab so you guys get good results all the time and maybe you might even switch over to spore swabs to really stretch out your budget and fill up your library. Let's go. Dripping on acid in the hotel lobby. Everything moving hella fast, Ricky Bobby. Floating in the ethers. Listen to the ethers, you can probably tell the future. Superhuman man. What's going on, Trip Team? First of all, I want to welcome you guys back to a brand new video. Now, if this is your first time ever on this channel right here, Welcome to the Trip Team family, TTF, that's what it's about. If you're into mycology, mushroom cultivation, the psychedelic lifestyle, chemistry, all that good stuff, then you found the right place. If this video helped you out, you like what I'm giving you, just go down below, hit that subscribe button and the bell off to the side so that way you guys know when I drop a new video. As always, all my social media is right here. We got Patreon, Instagram, Twitter, all that. Now, if you guys are just getting into this or you've been doing it for a long time and you want detailed videos, step by step, the most detailed videos there is, Go check out my Patreon because that's where all the good videos are at that you guys are looking for. Over there, I have a huge private library that you guys could go check out. Not only that, but I have a private chat room. I do one-on-one -on -one calls with you guys. We do monthly Zoom meetings. We do a bunch of different stuff. So make sure you guys go check it out. So enough with the shameless plugs. What are we going to be getting into today? Today we're gonna to be talking about spore swabs. Now, most of you guys already know what a spore swab is, but if you guys don't know what a spore swab is, pretty much it's a sterile cotton swab with spores on the end. Now, when we go out finding spores in the wild, you know, technically we're not supposed to harvest the mushroom because that's theft and it could be considered illegal. So to get a spore sample, we usually take a swab. Then we need to bring them swabs back and then we could put the spores to work. We could start viewing them under microscopes. We could start working with them on agar or whatever we want to do with them. Another thing with spore swabs is a lot of vendors are starting to sell spore swabs. So instead of getting a syringe for 20 to 30 bucks or a print from, you know, 30 to 50 bucks, now you could get spore swabs for five to ten dollars, which is really, really great. The only thing with that is you get less spores and you have to put a little bit more work in to actually put them to use. And the problem with that is a lot of people don't know what to do with them once they get them. So today we're going to be jumping in front of the flow hood and I'm going to show you guys the proper way to use a spore swab and get the most out of it. But with that said, let's jump in front of the flow hood and let's talk about what you're gonna need to put your spore swabs to use. The first thing you're gonna need is a still air box or a flow hood. Now I have a video, you can check it out right up here, showing you guys how to make a flow hood. And if that's too expensive for you guys, you really can't get into that right now. There's another video showing you guys how to make a flow box. It's kind of like a hybrid between a, a flow hood and a still air box and it works really, really well. Once you guys have that all taken care of, now you guys need to know what sterile tech is. Now, all you guys that have been doing this for a while, you guys already know what sterile tech is. So that's pretty much you're going into your workspace, 
with clean clothes, you're gonna disinfect all surfaces with Lysol or a 90-10 bleach mix. So that's 90% water, 10% bleach. You're gonna flame sterilize, you're gonna wear gloves, you're gonna use hand sanitizer. You're gonna try to be as clean as humanly possible. Now, if you guys are using a flow hood, I always suggest turning your flow hood on 20 to 30 minutes before you actually start working in front of it. What this is gonna do is it's gonna give it some time to cycle and filter out the air in the general workspace that you're gonna be working in. So you're gonna get much better results if you let it run a little bit before you get in front of it. So once you guys got the flow hood, you're following sterile tech, you've turned on your flow hood, now you wanna bring in your agar dishes so you want to have your agar dishes already poured. I have plenty of videos on that if you guys want to go check them out. You know, there's many different ways to make agar. There's PDA, LMEA, all different types of agar. I got videos on probably every single type of agar there is. So just go check that out because you guys will need to know how to make agar before you could actually use your spore swab. So I got 20 pre-poured dishes that I did last night that I'm gonna be using right now. Now you guys are also gonna need a pair of scissors or something sharp because we have to cut the stick of our swab, but anything will really work as long as it's sharp. I like using metal scissors because I could disinfect them before I actually use them. And that's what I suggest you guys doing too. You guys are also gonna need some 70% or higher isopropyl alcohol. You don't need very much, you just need a little bit. Next, you guys are gonna need a shot glass or something to hold that isopropyl in. So I like using a culture tube because my culture tube rack will hold the tube up straight and it's long and narrow, so it doesn't take much isopropyl to fill up what I actually need for my swabs. And I'm gonna show you what that means in a second, but you guys are gonna need some type of glass to hold some isopropyl in. If you have culture tubes, they'll work really well. And then of course, you need your spore swabs. I have two spore swabs here that we're gonna be using today. I'm gonna use one spore swab on 10 dishes and the other spore swab on 10 dishes. Now you guys might be saying, how far can I stretch a spore swab? How many plates can I inoculate with a spore swab? You can inoculate anywhere from 10 to 20 plates with the spore swab, no problem. It really just depends on how dense the spore swab is. If it's really, really dark, contains a lot of spores, you could stretch it a lot further. If it's a light spore swab, you might not be able to inoculate so many plates. So it really just depends on the spore swab itself. But roughly, you can inoculate 10 to 20 plates of agar with one spore swab. The last thing you guys are going to need is some parafilm or laboratory film. Now, if you guys don't have this, because I know it's a little bit expensive, especially when you're just starting out, you guys could use saran wrap. Saran wrap works just as well. But if you guys do have parafilm, I definitely suggest using it. You never want to leave your agar dishes without some type of security around the edges because different types of bacteria and molds could get up in there and contaminate your plate. So once you guys have everything together, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna put your gloves on, use some hand sanitizer, and get your gloves really, really good. Wait for it to evaporate before you guys move forward. The next thing you guys wanna do is you wanna fill up whatever you're gonna be using with your isopropyl alcohol. So I'm gonna be using a culture tube, so what you wanna do is you just wanna pour some isopropyl into the tube or glass that you're gonna be using. What we're gonna do with this is we're gonna dip the wooden stick in there once we cut it, and that's gonna help disinfect it so that nothing falls on top of our agar. You don't need much, you just need a little bit because the stick is gonna be only about an inch, an inch and a half after we cut it. Once you guys have your isopropyl in whatever container or glass that you guys are going to be using, now you guys can get everything set up. So the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that your agar dishes are directly in front of your flow hood. Now when it comes to working in front of a flow hood, even if your flow hood is 2 feet by 4 feet or 4 feet by 6 feet, it really doesn't matter. You always want to try to work in the center of your flow hood because that's where the cleanest air is going to be. So that's why you guys see me using this white rack. This white rack holds up all the stuff that I'm using directly in the center of my flow hood. Now, do you need this? No, you don't need this, but that's gonna be where the cleanest air is coming from. Now, once you have all your agar dishes all set, now what you wanna do is you wanna pull out one of your spore swabs and you wanna cut it. Now, this is very, very important. You just need enough wood to hold 
with two fingers. You don't need any excess. Now, when you guys are cutting the excess wood off of the swab, you guys want to make sure you're not touching the cotton swab with the spores at the end. Try to be very careful and not to touch those. Once you guys cut it and you have enough to grip onto, that's all you guys need. Now we need to sanitize that wood. So what we're going to do is we're going to use that isopropyl that we poured into our container and we're just going to dip the wood into the isopropyl. Remember, you guys don't want to get the isopropyl on the cotton swab itself. You just want it on the wood. It will evaporate really, really fast. Once it evaporates, then you guys could actually start inoculating your agar plates. Some people do what's called the dab. So you pretty much just dab it in the middle of the agar plate, turn it 360 degrees, and that's it. You close it up and you put it off to the side. Now the other method is called the S swipe or the swipe. So what people do is they rotate it and make an S. So what you want to do is rotate it very slowly and draw an S on the agar plate. You don't need to apply much pressure, just a little bit of pressure will get it done. You don't want to mess up the agar. So just light pressure, turning it the whole time as you draw an S. Once you guys do that, you could close it up and put it off to the side. Now, once you guys have the method that you like, whether it's the dab method or the S method or a swipe method, you guys are all set. Just continue to do this to all your agar dishes, and once you're done, we'll come back and wrap them with our parafilm or our saran wrap. All right, guys, so I inoculated all my plates. They're all ready to go, and now I'm gonna show you guys how to wrap them with the parafilm. So what you wanna do is you wanna cut strips that are about a half inch thick, and then you wanna start to stretch it around the rim of the agar dish. Pyrofilm is extremely stretchable, so you don't need much to make it all the way around the dish. Just try to be easy so you guys don't break it. If you break it, don't worry about it. Just pick up where you left off and continue stretching around. Once you guys do that, just make sure you guys put some pressure on it to make sure it's nice and tight to the dish and you guys are all set. Now, the only thing you have to do after you parafilm all your dishes is you have to label them. So you guys wanna make sure you label them what, you know, is it multi-spore, transfer one, transfer two, what type of fungi it actually is or whatever's on the dish and the date. That's the most important thing. Now, when it comes to storage of agar, you want to keep it in colonizing conditions. So you want it in a dry, cool place. Now you don't need light. You don't need darkness. So usually what we do is we just put them on a rack or somewhere where they're getting ambient light. They don't need to be in complete darkness and they definitely shouldn't be on a light schedule. So just keeping them in a cool, dry place that 68 to 78 is going to be perfectly fine. Now, once you guys are all done with the swab, you could dispose of everything now you get your plates all labeled once these plates grow out if the growth is nice and healthy you guys have the option right there and then to transfer it to grains and start using it if you do have some type of contamination or bacteria you're gonna have to isolate the healthy growth transfer that to a new plate and let it grow out make sure that it's clean and viable before you guys transfer the grains now, of course, if you guys want to start isolating from there, you know, different, you know, genetic sectoring and stuff like that, that's perfectly fine. But the most important thing when you guys get a spore swab is just making sure you have a clean culture to work with. We usually put it to grains, let it colonize, fruit it out, and then we select a fruit to clone and start isolating. That's generally the way we work when we're doing any type of isolation or cloning on agar. We usually don't start from multispore because there's way too many genetics. There's gonna be way too many sectoring and you don't wanna push too far ahead into too many generations or you could actually start to hurt the genetics. So we usually start isolating from the fruit tissue and then we'll get much less genetic sectoring. So it will take much less transfers to reach a monoculture or you know our desired results, whatever we're trying to do. And there you go, guys. That's the proper way you guys are supposed to inoculate agar with your spore swab. This is the way you're supposed to go with every single spore swab you get. You never wanna take a spore swab and just make a syringe out of it or something like that because there's a really high chance that it could get contaminated. So you always wanna to go to agar first 
and you want to follow this exact protocol to get the best results. As always guys, I want to thank you so much for your love and support. I know this was a really requested video by you guys because you guys are interested in picking up some sports swabs because they're so much cheaper. And if you guys do it the right way, it's a really good value for your money. You could get a lot of different genetics for really, really cheap. With that said, thank you guys so much for everything. I'm Willie Michael. Do good, be good, live good. Namaste.